CD and the DVD that you got on into tonight's subject. We have for subject tonight eschatology study number 41, Revelation chapter 16. And again, if you've been with us through all of these studies, you know now that we have passed chapter 11, in which we teach that that book could have been fulfilled in chapter 11, but God chose to add the other chapters or the other writings from 13 through 22 to give us a greater understanding of John's visions of Revelation and the end time and what is to come. And a lot of things are clarified in these preceding uh, latter chapters from uh, 12 throughout. And then by the same token, it confuses some people because those that don't believe that, then they consider uh, Revelation chapter 1 through 22 as the book of Revelation and that it's going to unfold in chronological order. But when you study it, 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 it just cannot be that way. There are things that we, we read about, uh, that we'll read about tonight that have already happened in chapters 8, 9, and 10. And that was when the seventh seal was opened, and within that seventh seal were seven angels, which had seven trumpets, and they began to blow. And that has already happened as far as the book is concerned. But here uh, in chapter 16 uh, and chapter 15, we read of seven other angels, some believe, that has each one a vial. And that word vial comes from the Greek word that means a bow, just a simple bow. And it's filled with the wrath of God, and they pour it out upon the earth. Um, but as you know, I said in our last study that I believe that the seven angels with the seven trumpets in the seven seal are the same as the angels that we're going to study about tonight. And we studied in the last lesson. So tonight, the study is going to be more of a comparison study. Comparing chapter 16 with the angels in chapter 16 with the angels in chapters 8, 9, and 10. And I want to show you how similar the wrath and the judgments that each one poured out. And, and my question is to those that believe that there are 14 angels with 14 different judgments, why would God seemingly do the same thing over again, do it twice? And it just don't make sense. And then again, the, the greatest factor in understanding is knowing. After reading Revelation chapter 11, the book absolutely, that is undeniable by any scholar, if, he, if he'll just read the, the 11th chapter, that this book absolutely could have ended in chapter 11 because the return of the Lord took place in chapter 11. Uh, not only that, the millennium is spoken of in chapter 11. And then it was finished in chapter 11. So that is, as far as I'm concerned, a biblical fact. But still, there are those that teach us, as you heard me say before, that there are 21 judgments of God, there are seven seals, which are different than the seven angels with seven trumpets, which are different than the seven angels with the seven vials. And even that is absolutely not correct, because when you read of the seven seal, the seven angels with the seven trumpets, is the, when the seventh seal was open, making whatever was contained in that seventh seal part of the seventh seal. And those seven angels were within that seventh seal. So making it actually, the seven trumpet angels are the seventh seal. And when you read it, then it, it, it's pretty well, it's easy as far as I am concerned to understand that. And tonight after we do this study, I hope that you'll see that it's far more plainer tonight than just that, knowing that it is a part of the seventh seal. But in Revelation 16 and verse 1, it says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels. And again, I believe he's speaking to those angels of Revelation chapter 8, 9, and 10 with the trumpets, saying, Go your ways, 
and pour out the vials or bowls of wrath of God upon the earth. And that's, that is, that's the only thing that is confusing uh, these teachers that believe that because they believe that the, the vial and the trumpet is two separate things. Well, it may be, but the angel could have had a trumpet in one hand to blow and a vial or a bow in the other pouring out the wrath. So that to me, uh, I mean, it don't, that's not surprising to me that the angels would blow a trumpet and then have a bowl of wrath to pour out. But in, in chapter 1, or verse 1 of 16, as we said, they are commanded to go and pour out their vows upon the earth. Verse 2, And the first went and poured out his vow upon the earth. And notice uh, where he pours it out, upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. So we know it happened during the time of great tribulation, which we've already read about. The tribulation period began in Revelation chapter 6. Now, when we read through these and make these comparisons, there are a little differences in what goes on. But the, the simple explanation for that is, is that he's going into greater detail or depth of what the judgments that are being poured out upon the earth consist of. So that is not proof enough to try to make the point that they're two separate angels. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noise and a grievous sore upon, upon the men, which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which which worshipped his image. Now, if you'll go to Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7. The first angel in Revelation 8. Well, again, we're reading in Revelation 16, the first angel. You know, there's really not two first angels. But it says, the first angel sounded, and therefore hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And there's the key. Both these angels, it is referenced in chapter 8 and chapter 16, that their judgment is poured out upon the earth. And the third part of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. So we see the similarities between these two angels. And the key point is that they both poured, or when they blowed the trumpet, the judgment was upon the earth. Now, if that was all that we had, then one could make a point just so incidental. But we're going to find this throughout these seven angels. Back to verse 3 of Revelation chapter 16. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of dead men, or a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Now, go back to Revelation 8, verse 8 and 9. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. Well, that's the same place that the second angel with the trumpet was cast into or upon the sea. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire, was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Verse 9. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea, and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And again, with this second angel... They both, both these angels, their judgments was upon the sea. And then the question to be asked, why would God do that twice? It just don't make sense. And when you add the book together, Revelation chapter 1 through 11, and then begin to study chapter 13 up into where we are now, chapter 16, he, he is only going back and clarifying, or maybe going into some greater detail as to the judgment. And there are not 
14 separate angels, but they are one and the same. Verse 4 of Revelation chapter 6. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Now, Revelation chapter 8, 10 and 11. And the third angel, both of them were third, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of what? The rivers. The same rivers that we just read of in Revelation 16 4. Now, these three angels, it's not coincidence anymore. One could have been coincidental. Maybe two could have been coincidental. Three coincidences that these first three angels of Revelation 16 are pouring out their judgments on the exact same place as the first three angels did of Revelation chapter 8. It's not coincidental. It's rightly dividing the word of truth, putting in the time and study to read all of it, separating it, rightly dividing it, and then knowing what God is trying to reveal unto us. And again, I've always said, this book is not hard to be understood. Revelation, Revelation is not a complicated book. It's only complicated as any other book of the Bible if it is not read, if it is not studied, if its doctrines are not sought out in depth to get and gain the understanding of what the writer and most of all what God is trying to tell us. So now it is absolutely not coincidence that these four angels uh, or three angels poured out their judgments upon the same exact place. Verse 5 through 7 of Revelation 16. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. For well, they have shed the blood of saints. Notice this key here, that during this time of great tribulation, there's going to be the death and great bloodshed of the saints of God. And again, there are those that will teach you that that's you. If the rapture were to come tonight and you would enter into the great tribulation period, that it's possible that many of you would be slaughtered. Your blood would be shed. But what is wrong with that doctrine? The problem with that doctrine is, is that we, the saints, the bride, the church, was promised deliverance. We was promised an escape route. We were promised that if we would repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, be filled with the Holy Ghost, live according to God's Word, endure until the end, or be alive when the rapture come, that we would escape for the Bible Paul explicitly says, for we were not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. A direct contradiction. So we see that the saints here in verse 6 of chapter 16 cannot be the church. Yet, they are saints of God that will be slaughtered during this period of time. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. Now, didn't we read back between Revelation chapter 6 and verse 11 that the beast would make war with the saints and overcome them? Even in chapter 13, that tribulation saints will be overcome, and they will. But the church cannot be overcome. He said in Matthew to the church, They are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We cannot be defeated if we don't want to be defeated. We win. We have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We have that power that's keeping the Antichrist from revealing himself even now. Because there is no power greater than the power of the Holy Ghost that embodies the church of Jesus Christ. I cannot understand why post-tribulation preachers cannot 
see that. And they'll stand in the pulpit and tell you that we're so close to the end that many of you that live right, live holy, baptize right, filled with the Holy Ghost, in the house of the Lord on this Wednesday, after not ever hearing the Lord in an audible voice, never have seen Him, but you believe that He rose again on the third day, He's going to chop your head off <laughs> so you can get to heaven. I know it sounds funny, but it sounds funny because it is actually that ridiculous. God's not going to do that to us. God's going to honor your great faith tonight because you come out to Bible study on this Wednesday when you could have been doing a lot of other things, but you chose to come out to the house of the Lord. And How many times have you heard me say, to hear me teach about a God that you've never seen? and a God that you've never heard, you see. But you believe the word of the Lord because the Bible says it. And you're out here because you want to be saved. You live the way you do because you want to be saved. That's why we are promised. We are absolutely promised. We will not suffer not one millisecond of the great tribulation period. Why they don't understand that is beyond me. Verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. Thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, notice that term, altar. Out of the altar say, true and righteousness are thy judgment. So these that have been killed are literally speaking from an altar. Now, if she'll go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the what? Altar. In verse 7, that's where these verses are coming from. There's not two altars. There's only one. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God is that not just what we read about in verse 5, 6, and 7 of Revelation chapter 16? That saints that are killed and their blood shed for their testimony which they heard. Verse 10, 11. <laughs> That's where you want to go. <laughs> and they cried with a loud voice. Sometimes I believe them girls are spitting it back by the spit on the mark. But they do a great job. They really do. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? Now they're speaking, but these saints of them all to hear spoke too. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So again, it is clear. The verses that we just read in Revelation 16, 5, 6, and 7 is the same as the reference of Revelation 6, 9, 10, and 11. It is so clear. How could all this just be coincidental that these verses in chapter 16 are almost identical to the verses in Revelation 8 and 9. It's not. It's not. He's just going into greater depth. Verse 8 and 9 of Revelation 15. And, and the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. Key word, sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now I go to Revelation 8 and verse 12. Again, the fourth angel. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of what? The sun. That's the key word. Was smitten. And the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. 
again? Coincidence? I don't think so. Back to verse 10 of Revelation 16. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. Now what's happening here is that the kingdom of the Antichrist has been set up, the mark of the beast has been given, and has been received, and they are now followers of Satan, and the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon these people that follow the beast, received his mark. And the fifth seal poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their teeth for pain. It's going to be a terrible, tormenting time on earth. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Now go to Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 through 12, and we'll read that quickly, and we'll be reading about the same thing, only in greater depth. Notice again, Fifth angel in Revelation 16. Fifth angel in Revelation 9. There's not two fifth angels. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts, all he's doing is, is, is speaking of his wrath. God is angry with the sins of the world, the direction of the world, and all of those that would reject God. God is angry. Is angry then, or which will be the future as it was in the days of Noah. And he is a destroyer. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass or the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. Now, is that not the kingdom of the beast? Is that not the seed of the beast? Absolutely. Coincidence? I think not. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented. Five months and their torment was as has the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. This is nothing more than the wrath of God poured out upon the kingdom or the seed of the beast. And the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. Now, this could be both figuratively or symbolically. It could be that these are the descriptions of these actual creatures from hell. I preached a message once, I think, uh, called the creatures from hell. And they could be just that, these monstrous beasts. Uh, with tails like scorpions with stingers. It could be also the wrath of God and, and John seeing things, modern weaponry, and that's the only way he knows how to describe it. And we know now you see these jet airplanes and helicopters and they, they, they fire off these missiles and all this sort of thing. Some believe that that could be it. Uh, irregardless, it is the wrath of God being poured out upon the seed of the beast. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men, 
five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But, he, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. I believe both mean destruction. One woe is past, and behold, there come two more, two woes more hereafter. And again, it is God's judgments being poured out upon the earth, the people of the earth, the seed of the beast. Verse 12 of chapter 16, 12 through 14. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. You see, the key word here is Euphrates. And everybody knows that's over in, uh, around Iraq, ancient Babylon. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters there were dried up, that the way the kings of the east might be prepared. And, of course, it's making a way for the armies, many believe, to be China, and I'll agree with that that marches into Israel from the east as Magog comes from the north, which is Russia. Egypt and her allies come from the south, and then the west will already be there, uh, which I believe America will be there uh, as the west with the Antichrist. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters over were dried up, that the way the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, now the mouth of the beast, and now the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And it's making a direct reference to the battle of Armageddon. Uh, now go to Revelation uh, chapter 9, verse 13 through 21. Again, the sixth angel. See, see how identical that it is and not coincidental. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound where? In the great river Euphrates, the same place that, we just read from it. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire of uh, Jasoph and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire, smoke, and brimstone. And then again, this could be modern-day warfare, what he's seeing, as opposed to monsters, however one would choose to interpret it. By these three was the third part of men killed, and it says the third part of men killed, and there are seven billion would that be about two and a half billion, Roger? Somewhere thereabouts. That's a lot of people killed in it, during the sounding of one angel. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and that's what you see at war, these, these blasts, whether it be nuclear, atomic bombs, or, or just mortars, or whatever it may be. By the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouth. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were likened to serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not, we just read that, not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, we just read that, nor of their sorcery, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Men will be so evil during that time. They will have already been turned over to reprobation. Gentile nations will have 
already made their decision to reject God. We are in the dispensation now known as the times of the Gentiles, wherein Gentile nations can be saved. But when the rapture takes place, that door is closed, and Gentile nations can no longer be saved. And what they will do when the beast, the Antichrist, sets up his government, issues the mark, commands all to worship his image, they will readily and more than gladly accept that. And that then brings forth the anger of God upon Gentile nations that they might be destroyed. Approximately two and a half billion, at where we're just reading at now, shall be killed. God is angry. God is angry at sin, and that's what it all goes back to. It's all about sin. And what is sin? Sin is the most simplest of subjects in the Bible. The simplest. And all sin is, is doing something God said not do. That's all sin is. Or not doing something that God said do. And it was simplified in the very beginning when God looked at that man that he created out of the dust of the ground and gave him all of that power and all of that knowledge and made him actually God to this world that he ruled over the fowls of the air and the fishes of the sea and all of the animals. He commanded them all. And God just said, Adam, out of all the trees of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And that wasn't a hard contract, was it? Not near as hard a contract as me and you, Doc. <laughs> Is that right? I mean, there's a thousand different ways me and you could sin. They went the one way he could sin. And yet he did. All sin was, God said, Adam, don't eat of it. And Adam ate. That It's just that simple. And folks cannot understand it. I preached a little bit Sunday night. I just couldn't understand it. But, but gay folks, irregardless of theologies, irregardless of theories, and man trying to decipher the mind of God and try to reason or find the reason behind why God tells us to do certain things and not to do certain things, insomuch then that when man cannot understand the reasoning behind a commandment, then he feels within himself, then it can't be too much wrong with it. And that's just what the devil wants us to think. If we read something that we're not supposed to do, the first thing we do by nature is analyze it, don't we? But you know what we want to do? I've always told you we're all nosy by nature. We actually want to know why God don't want us to do it. And it's not good enough for man that he said not do it. That's just not good enough. You know how when you tell your children you don't want them to do something they want to do? Why? They all say, well, well why can't? And then here you have to go and try to explain to them, maybe there's danger. It's just not for their well-being. It may be good for a while, but not in the long run. And You see? And then we have that same attitude with God. When God says, hey, look, you can't do this, then the first thing we do, we analyze it. Well, well, just what's wrong with it? And then when God don't tell us why, then we try to figure out why. And then when we can't figure out why or what the wrong is, we say, well, I know he said not do it, but there can't be a whole lot wrong with it. And then we go ahead and do it. So then we transgress. We become transgressors. We have fallen into iniquity. And, and of course, many messages have been preached on the subject of the little fox and the whole divine. I heard a message not long ago preached on it. And, and, and what it is, 
what generally the preachers are outlining when they preach that is, uh, now we know thou shalt not kill, don't we? We don't kill people. We know that the Bible says thou shalt not steal, so we don't walk in stores and department stores and load down our purses or pockets and try to walk out some kind of place because, because we know that. See, That don't have to be explained to us because we know it don't belong to us, you see. But just as sure as there's something that, that we really can't just quite figure out. And again, I'll, I'll use this as an example and we'll move on because I've heard so many question me on this. And I say, what the Bible says that a woman is not to plait her hair. Now, we've all read that, have we not? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul uses the word that, that says broiled. And Simon Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, uses the word plait. And the scriptures are clear. I was just discussing it just not too awful long ago with a good friend of mine that, that had changed his belief on that and now believes it's all right and that's just to show me whether that it's all right. And the scriptures are, are clear through the apostles, and that's as well as God speaking. Um, he said, not with broided hair, speaking to the women. And, and, and Simon Peter said, who's out with adorning, not at lips, but he's out with adorning, not to plait in their hair. So what they did and what these, these people did, and even this good friend of mine did and others, they tried to analyze it. And say, well, what's wrong with it? You know. And I appreciate this to be seen for 35 years. I still don't know what's wrong with it. Other than God said not do it. So that made it wrong with me. But why he chose to have the apostle to the Gentiles and the apostle to the Jews, Jew and Gentile life, women not to plait their hair. I have my own ideals about it, but it's certainly not biblical. The only biblical fact is that's wrong to do it. But they try to analyze Well, when they analyze it, and you see a woman that has her hair plaited, then you say, well, what possibly could be wrong with that if she's allowed to put a rubber band in it and make a ponytail out of it? I mean, what is it? What is it that makes one wrong, one right? You see, and and that is one of those things that God did not list in Scripture as to why He didn't want to do that. So that's where man begins to try to analyze God and try to analyze sin and iniquity. The wrong is this: the same wrong. Now watch this. Let me read verse 9 of 1 Timothy chapter 2 and give you the general idea. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame faces as the bride, not with broided hair. Now I'm telling you, anybody that's got any education at all that, that is literate at all can read that and see that According to Apostle Paul, that women are commanded here not to broil their hair. And then he says, or gold, or pearls, or costly array. So they analyze that and try to figure out, well, why, what is the wrong with it? Why? And then they'll read 1 Peter chapter 3 and, and do the same thing. And Simon Peter said, who's out with adorning, not let it be the plaiting of the hair. So we know for a fact that a broid and a plaid is the same thing that's in the plain of your hair. For whatever reason, God did not want women to do it. And I don't know why. I really, really don't. I just know. See, does it harm the hair? Not to my knowledge. I mean, if you, it wouldn't seem to me that if you had your hair plaited, or if you had your hair in a ponytail, that a plait would damage your hair, and that's the reason that he does. So it's not that. It is the fact. There are a lot of commandments that God gives, not as punishment, not because there was anything literally wrong with it, 
but that we could show our love for him. Now watch this. In the garden, he said, Adam, out of all of the trees of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But the tree that's in the midst of the garden, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. Now what happened instantly when Adam ate of that fruit? Physically, nothing. So that tells us that the Bible said that fruit was good, desirous to the eyes, and make one wise. It wasn't poison. I guarantee you it was as sweet and as tasteful as any other fruit in the garden. There was absolutely nothing wrong with that piece of fruit. What made it wrong? God said, not do it. I don't think there's anything or any way a woman plaiting her hair could damage it. But that's not why he said not do it. He said not do it. He wanted to see if Adam loved him. Then he wants to see if you love him. You see? Why don't he want me to let my hair grow down on my shoulders? I mean, I used to have hair down on my shoulders. It didn't hurt me none. Right? As far as I know, it didn't pull on my weight my brain down that made me dumber. I don't think it did that. You know why he don't want me to have long hair? Because he said not do it. You see? So I don't let my hair grow long because I love him. And when I read something in the Bible that he says not do, whether I understand it or not, I don't question God on it. I say, God, if you say not do it, then I'm not going to do it. And that is good enough. But any time we try to dissect God and try to figure out why something wrong, or we have the need to know why something is wrong, then we're going down the wrong road. We need to accept what God says, what He says. And if He says no, accept it as no. And if He says yes, accept it as yes. But that is one of the great faults with man. Back to verse 15 of Revelation chapter 16. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that washeth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, verse 15 is somewhat a little tricky between the doctrine of the pre-trib and the post-trib because we use that statement not here in Revelation 16, or at least I don't. We use the term as a thief as in a secret coming, and it does mean that as in to rapture. But here, coming as a thief don't mean that. It means... Suddenly. Watch this. In Matthew chapter 24, he uses the same term, 37 through 44. He is clearly speaking of the end of time and the great tribulation period in all of Matthew 24. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall be two in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. You see, the return of the Lord won't be secret, but they won't know exactly when he's coming either. That's why he's telling Israel to be ready. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what was the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for an hour. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man's coming. What that means is, 
it don't mean in that time that it's a secret coming, as in rapture, but it's in a sudden coming, is what we're referring to. It. Second Peter, chapter three, verse ten, speaking of the great tribulation period. See, we know that the Lord's coming back twice, but not in either did He give the exact time and date. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now watch this to show you that the definition here or the interpretation here is different than coming as in a rapture. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night into which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. So that tells us that he's not going to slip in as a thief, take something out, then nobody won't know what's going on. Because at this return of the Lord, everyone on earth will know it because the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. A thief won't break in your house and, not ma- and make a great noise. Let him come in, shout, and holler, and get out of bed. I'm about to rob you. That's not what he does. That's why the meanings and the interpretation are somewhat different here. In fact, they are different. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The heavens will be on fire. The earth also and works that are therein shall be burned up. So there's nothing secret about this come. Him liking it as a thief just simply means suddenly. And in an hour, as you know not. For in we use scriptures as a thief in the night. When it is clear he's making a direct reference as to a secret coming in the clouds, which no one will see him but the bride. Verse 16. Or Revelation 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Everybody on earth knows the term Armageddon. And Armageddon uh, is the valley right outside of Jerusalem where many, many battles have been fought. It's a strategic battlefield area there. Uh, and that's where God is going to gather north, south, east, and west. And there will be the battle of Armageddon. But it is also referenced not just as Armageddon, uh, Matthew 24, verse 37. Or actually, not that. It's Zechariah 12 and 11. There you are. And the prophet Zechariah prophesies of the battle of Armageddon. In that day, when you study Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, it is specifically in reference to the great tribulation period. And that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem. It will, for many of them be killed. We just read it. As the morning of Had Berimamon in the valley of Megiddo. And Megiddo is Armageddon when you read that phrase. Joel chapter 2, or 3, verse 2. Joel makes reference also. I will also gather all nations, north, south, east, and west, and we'll bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. So Megiddon is also referred to as the valley of Jehoshaphat. And we'll plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they parted my land. So when you read of Megiddon, you read of Armageddon in the valley of Jehoshaphat, it's speaking of the same place which is situated uh, right outside of Jerusalem, back to verse 17 of chapter 16. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, notice this phrase, it is done. Well, that means it's over, right? Well, sure. Now go back to Revelation 10 and 7. And I know these random people hate hearing me say this when they listen. Again, let me reiterate. Revelation 10 and 7 is not when Mary and Brown. Okay? I've talked too much on that. They are, I'm telling you, there are people just got feisty over that. And they believe with every fiber of their heart. Revelation 10, 7, that seventh angel is William, Mary, and Brown. They did. So that is beyond me. 
But watch what he says. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. Same as it is done. If something is done, it is finished. Again, both seventh angels makes reference to something being finished or done. Is it coincidence that all seven angels, their judgments were so similar in executing that it is far greater than just being coincidental? It is not. The seven angels with the seven trumpets are the self same angels with the seven vials. And I believe, and certainly it is my view, that is the correct teaching. Back to verse 18 through 21 of Revelation 16. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake. For there was coming an earthquake greater than any earthquake that's ever happened on earth. Now, I don't, I never studied to find out or looked it up. I don't know what the greatest earthquake has been to date. Does anybody know or even close? There's been some major earthquakes. I don't even know even on what scale. I don't know if there's ever been a 10. Do you? But they, now, they come up with a scale, and I believe this goes to 10 on the Richter scale or something like that. And I mean, seven or eight are really bad. I mean, it, it, roads fall in, bridges crumble, buildings fall, cause tsunamis. Now, I could be mistaken on this, but I don't think there's ever been a 10 which would be virtually total devastation, I would imagine, especially in the general vicinity of the earthquake. But there is coming an earthquake. Uh, of course, it's going to be situated in the Middle East. But who knows how far around the globe, it, say, that, say that 10 is the highest on man's scale. Or say God's scale is 12 or 15. I mean, there is a fault line running down through... California and was it San Andreas um, that I think even scientists are even worried about now and it may have had some rumblings down through the years right? I don't know if they've had any major earthquake uh, in California I, I just didn't do my study on it but I do know they, they fear because of the distance of that fault line the San Andreas fault line that it's possible that that, that portion could break off into the sea. So who knows the magnitude of this earthquake that's going to come. I will give you a prophecy to win Branham said, now, you know, I, like I said, as far as I understand this, I have studied Branham's teachings in depth. I have. I, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he's got 900 and some messages that you can even get online. You can listen to his tapes, and I've listened to a lot of his tapes. I've listened to his preachings. I've studied a lot of his uh, works, his, his prophecies that he's given. Uh, I just don't agree with a lot of his doctrine. Branham was a man that was supposed to have come into the apostolic faith. Now, do I say William Branham was lost? Absolutely not. I would never say that about that man because I didn't know him, number one. What I say about William Branham is that I read his book on seven seals that he wrote, uh, I've listened to his teachings. I've read many other writings of his. And there's a lot of things that he taught that I fervently disagree with. Uh, but he did, he was once a believer in baptism and titles, and he changed to Jesus' name. And, 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 and he changed to being filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, all of the other part of it between him and God, I'd never judge him on whether he's saved or not. I do think that a lot of his followers made more out of him than what he ever intended. Because I have had someone to tell me that William Branham was God. You know, that's how fanatical. Now, people like that, you know, whether they're lost or not, they're crazy. I know that. One of the two. So I don't know which one would be worse, they're lost or they're good. I've had him tell me that there was as much God in William Branham as there was Jesus Christ. I've had him tell me that Jesus wasn't coming back to rapture us and William Branham was. Now, folks, when you get when you get into a doctrine that bad, man, you've lost it up here. I mean, you I mean, 
you ain't even left healed. You ain't even in the ballpark. But as to Branham's salvation himself, if he was baptized in Jesus' name and he believed in, 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 in the oneness of God and uh, had the Holy Ghost, then I would never say that he was lost. I, I just wouldn't do it. People made a lot of it. But he did. He did give a, I don't know if it's prediction or it's prophecy. Sometimes he was careful about how he used the word things. But if I'm not mistaken, he was standing him and his son somewhere in California. Uh, I don't know, Rod, would San Francisco or somewhere? Too, would that be on the seaside of the fault line? Okay. Somewhere with San Diego? Okay. I believe somewhere through there, if I'm getting it just right, that he was in that part with his son, and he told his son that there would be a day that that would break off and go into the ocean. See? And that was a, uh, that is a prophecy that he is saying it. See? Uh, of course, we know to date that, that that's never happened. Uh, but what I'm saying is that this there, are, there is coming a great earthquake, but it, it was sent around Jerusalem because it will be split up in three pieces. Go back to verse 19. And the great city was divided in three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. That's what makes me think that this earthquake could be far above a 10 and could even reach into places like the United States of America that's thousands of miles from the Middle East where that, that fault line could just break right off, buddy, all the way up and down to the coast there, uh, the, the, the west coast, just break and it sank right on into the sea. Uh, it wouldn't be a bit surprised if that wouldn't happen. And there fell among, well, we have even know there's been slight tremors, I think, in Kentucky and West Virginia and around about in the, in the last few years. Not nothing major, but just little tremors. Earthquakes were getting more frequent. And Jesus said that would be a sign of the time uh, earthquakes in divers places. And there fell upon men a great hell out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. I believe somebody has measured that by about 100 pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. So we know that that's coming. John wasn't the only one to sing it. The last place in Scripture we'll go be Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Behold, the day cometh, he's speaking of the great tribulation, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled or plundered, the women ravished or raped, and half of the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be shall not be cut off from the city. And that's Jerusalem he's talking about. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, which is Armageddon. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, that's where he ascended from, way back there when he led them out as far as Bethany, I believe in Acts chapter 1, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of, that will be the center of the earthquake, toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall, shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azil. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzzah, the king of Judah. So there must have been a great earthquake then in those days. And the Lord my God shall come. Who is that? Jesus. Another one God scripture. And all the saints with thee. That's the raptured bride. So these teachings are quite clear as far as the revelation is concerned. But again, my point of this teaching tonight of, of chapter 16 is to show that there is biblical proof that the seven angels with the seven trumpets are the same as the seven angels with the seven vials. And I think the scripture bear that out. Next week, being the Lord's will, we will talk about and teach on chapter 17, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. A lot of people don't want to read or hear about that, especially in the 
religious phenomenal world that we live in now, but nevertheless, it's part of the book and must be taught and the abominations of the earth. All right.